Hi, everyone who just joined. We're going to give it a couple of minutes for everyone that might be having technical difficulties or is just wrapping up uh, work. Uh, so we'll be starting at 12.05. Um, happy Earth Day. We'll begin very soon. Uh, thank you again. Um, I was just going to let some more people trickle in. We'll start at 5.05, .05, about two more minutes. All right, so first off, happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the UM Rosenstiel School, also known as Erasmus. Um, it is the Marine Science Student Graduate Student Organization, MSGSO's Sustainability Earth Week Initiative. <laughs> so uh, that is a mouthful, but basically a bunch of us got together and we planned on having Earth Week prior um although with the current situation we wanted to continue to still have it and bring it to you guys online because this is a community experience um, but we would also like to keep this a positive community experience so this is a no troll zone and so anyone who um is not being respectful will be dismissed without warning okay um, i have a great team of eco warriors on the lookout so um with that being said let's uh, dive into the panel. Okay. Um, all right. So we are in gallery view. 
Okay. So first, I would like everyone to go around and introduce themselves. We have six really great uh, sustainability leaders from the community here, some of them being Rasmus alumni. Uh, so we'll kick it off and Nicholas, we'll start with you. Thanks a lot, hey everybody. My name is Nicholas Kamsujewski. I graduated from the Rosenstiel School in 2017 from the MPS program. And currently I work for Iberostar Hotels and Resorts. We have an environmental movement called Wave of Change that I work as a science communicator for. We work with three main principles. First one, to move beyond plastics and towards a circular economy. Second, to promote the responsible consumption of seafood. And the third is to improve coastal health. Great, thank you. And then we'll move um, over to uh, Patrick. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Patrick Rin. Uh, I also graduated from, from Rasmus 2016 in the uh, Applied Marine Physics program. And while I was at Rasmus, I started sort of a side project um, in experimenting with science communication through kind of um, creative and different strategies. Um, and it started with a lot of video work and media work. And eventually it sort of organically involved into um, what we call a cause-based uh, apparel brand. So we specialize in making what we call advocate apparel, which is uh, environmentally responsible clothing uh, that is basically meant to be a science communication tool. So when people wear it, they can help um, broadcast and uh, spread useful information around the world. Awesome, we're really happy to have everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, Allison, we'll move to you. Yeah, of course. Hi everyone, my name is Allison and I did not graduate from Rathsmiths, if I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> um, but I am super excited to be here. Thank you so much, Kayla and the whole UM team for putting this together, putting a virtual Earth Day celebration together. Absolutely love it, so happy to be here. And I just wanted to just say thank you for everyone that's attending too. Um, just celebrating Earth Day and talking all about sustainability with us. So currently I oversee market management for the Florida Division of Hungry Harvest. We are a farm to doorstep produce delivery company um, that where we rescue produce and we pioneered the ugly fruits and vegetables movement. And I will talk more in detail about that shortly. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, and you did say that pretty correctly, Erasmus. It is tough. I didn't know how to pronounce it my first time, <laughs> admittedly, but um, okay. Uh, Houston, would you like to go? Sure. Good evening, friends and family. Uh, my name is Houston Riley Cypress, and uh, my pronouns are he and they. And the kind of work that I've been involved in personally is as a poet and an artist and an environmentalist. And my background is that I'm from the Otter Clan which is one of the families that make up the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida. And so we live out there in the, in the Everglades, just west of Miami. So um, lately I've been doing a lot of different kinds of work, but all environmentally focused through my nonprofit, Love the Everglades Movement. And I've also recently joined the board of directors for Unity Coalition, Coalition Unida, which is concerned with LGBTQ human rights, and they do it in a bilingual fashion. And I think that's really awesome. So things like art, conflict management, um, definitely like multimedia communications, um, gender diversity and spirituality. These are the kinds of things I love to um, advocate for through the different organizations I collaborate with. So this is an invitation for you and everybody here watching. Like I invite you to join me in creating portals between worlds. Great, thank you Reverend and we appreciate uh, the perspective and having you here with us. Um, we'll go, we'll continue. Uh, Victoria? Hi everyone, um, my name is Victoria. Happy Earth Day. Um, I'm a science communicator, marine ecologist, artist, and low waster. Um, recently I started my own business called Trove Jewelry and I focus on using, tapping into the excess that we have in our world to create art such as um, plastic marine debris and invasive species. So I incorporate both of those things in my jewelry. Thank you, Victoria. And our last panelist, Rachel. 
Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Silverstein. I graduated from Rasmus in 2012 with my PhD in coral reef ecology. Um, and from there I went and did a Canals Fellowship in DC with the Senate Commerce Committee and then came back to Miami to serve as the Miami Waterkeeper, which is my current position. I've been here about five years. And Miami Waterkeeper is a local nonprofit organization focused on protecting the water you love and ensuring swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water for all. And those are rights given to us under the Clean Water Act. So we do a number of activities um, and have a, a, a series of interdisciplinary approaches to achieve those goals. And that includes doing community outreach and education, scientific research, and also legal and policy advocacy. So I'm happy to answer any more questions about our work. Um, and thank you for hosting this and for joining us. All right, thank you, Rachel. Thank you all of my panelists again for being here today. I'm really excited. Um, happy Earth Week again to all of our attendees. Uh, we will get started and I will put us all in gallery so you can see us all together. Uh, and we'll begin with our first uh, round of discussion. So sustainability is kind of one of those words that gets tossed around a lot, but you know, it's not really defined. And I feel like a lot of people don't actually know what it means. And it actually, the definition varies from person to person. So I think I'm interested and we are interested in knowing what does sustainability mean to you? And how have you incorporated sustainability into your business and organization as well as your daily life? Patrick, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think uh, my background, a lot of it is in engineering. And I think I get confused a lot about what people mean by sustainability. I think a lot of times people think of it as um, living in such a way that does no environmental harm. Um, and for my life experience, that's pretty much impossible. So when I think about sustainability, I don't think necessarily about having this sort of perfect um, lifestyle that um, does no harm. It's more about um, being honest with yourself about the harm that you do do, being candid about it, being open about it, and trying to reduce it as much as you can. Uh, and the same goes with our company. Um, there's very few things in this world you can do without having some, some kind of impact on the environment. Um, and the best we can do is, is really try to be very mindful about that and to, to take steps wherever we can um, to reduce that impact. And again, be transparent with our community about not just what we do well, but more importantly, what we still maybe don't do perfectly. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the, um, that conversation. And oftentimes, especially in the business world, businesses focus on what they do well and they kind of ignore what they do bad. Um, but we have to sort of make sure we talk about both. And, um, and recognize that nobody's perfect and that we, you know, just try to make incremental improvements wherever we can. All right, thank you, Patrick. Well, uh, Allison? Yep. Um, so what sustainability means to me and my goal for sustainability is um, intergenerational well-being. So what does that mean? So I'll break down both words. So intergenerational, I mean time and place. So not just for right now, but for the future. And then for place, it's not just here in South Florida, but it's all over for the entire world. And then well-being, I mean, not just meeting like the needs, the basic needs of people, the basic needs of our planet, of businesses and profits, et cetera. But we wanna have good health, education, opportunity, nature, community, security, et cetera, et cetera. So basically intergenerational well-being to me, intergenerational well-being means to me that just conserving a balance for a better world and for all and in the present and in the future. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Um, we will let Nicholas go ahead. Sure. So I work for the tourism industry. I work for a private hotel company and the tourism industry consumes a lot. And since working in the tourism industry, I kind of shifted my definition of sustainability to 
where you're consuming resources at a rate that does not deplete the resources available. So we are working specifically to make sure that we're not doing that. And we're doing that in a couple of ways. The first one is that we're looking to promote more responsible seafood consumption. So that's ensuring that we're buying seafood from sources that have traceability so that you understand everything from how your fish was caught all the way up until how it ends up on your plate. And we're also really transforming all of our hotels into a fully functioning circular economy. So at every single one of our hotels, which happen to not be open right now, as you guys could assume, um, in every hotel room, you will not find a single single use plastic in there. And by the end of this year, that's going to be transformed into the entire hotel operation. So it's really ensuring that you're not consuming resources at a rate at which those resources are going to be depleted, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Interesting. Uh, Reverend, would you like to go ahead? Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, cool. So my definition is not to deplete the resources, not to overexploit. But I'm also being respectful of other knowledge systems. And so that means to embrace the value of other knowledge systems. And from my Mikasuki perspective, my definition of sustainability is to be in balance with the circle of life. And which means not to put humanity at the center of things, but to use our gifts and our skills and talents to be in service of nature and to find our place in that. Um, so that's how I work with it. Thank you. All right, I think that's it for that first question. Let's keep building on this, right? So some of you have talked about how this is incorporated into your businesses as well as your daily lives. So beyond that, how has sustainability been a tool in promoting what you do? And what is the greatest return on your investment for message promotion of sustainability? Because sometimes it does come across as this heavy to be concept, right? And so um, as we've just learned, especially from a lot of these individuals, sustainability is much more than that. So how have you guys used it as um, a tool? Uh, Rachel? Muted. There we go. Uh, so I think for us at Miami Waterkeeper, sustainability is really a central part of our ethos as an organization um, in terms of not only the work that we do as an organization, but in our outreach as well, trying to make um, a culture shift to promote awareness of people and their impact on the environment. And I think right now as well during um, this shutdown, while it has been horrible for everybody, um, some of the small silver linings that we've been able to attach on to has been the fact that we've seen the water rebound and we've had a lot of really interesting wildlife sightings. Um, and that I think has, um, and which I can talk about more in, in a minute as well, but I think that's really um, caused people to take a pause and to connect with the nature that they see around them. Um, that they might not usually have time to notice. And I'm hoping that that, that connection um, lasts into the future as well. And um, people become more aware of our impact on the environment as a result and that sustainability infuses more into the culture. Well, yeah, that, that's great. That's a great point too, because return on investment doesn't necessarily need to be monetary. It could be awareness of what's happening, right? And so um, I really appreciate that perspective as well. Um, let's go to Nicholas. Yeah, so I think what you said earlier, Kayla, was that when people think about sustainability, they don't tend to think about things that are very like high quality or anything. So what, what we are really trying to do with Iberostar and Wave of Change more specifically is really try to shift that conversation. So when people are going on holiday and they're really trying to experience a vacation and they read about this hotel that's incredibly sustainable and that it's got all these new projects going on that they're not associating that with them getting less of a product than they would have had otherwise. So the return on investment that we have is really to try and drive people over to our hotels based on the fact that we are becoming a more sustainable business. So sustainability really is the business model that we're trying to move towards in the future for us. 
Great, that's interesting as well. Um, we'll go down to uh, Houston. Well, so when I think about the tools that we use to get the message out, I guess it really depends on the communities that we're trying to engage with. Because um, I think the biggest return on investment for us is about people power. And what that means is showing up for each other. Um, whether that's collaborations through art, whether that's using our um, network to get um, press coverage of communities' needs or what they're working on. Um, and you know what? Direct action is also a great tool of getting the sustainability message out. And that um, goes right along with showing up for each other. Because when you do that, they end up strengthening relationships and then those community members show up for you. So I think that's been the biggest return on our investment too. Yes, uh, more uh, different responses, right? So I love that everyone's answering from a different perspective through people, through planet, through profit, all parts of our human ecosystem. So uh, we'll have Allison. Yeah, so similar to what Rachel and Nicholas were saying that at Hungry Harvest, sustainability is really at the core of our business model as well. Um, so to some of what we do, we're a farm to doorstep produce, uh, rescue produce delivery service. And you might be wondering, well, what is rescue produce? So what that is, is if apples are too big, if oranges are too small, if a pepper is misshapen, or if there's just so many onions, grocery stores don't want it because it's not either aesthetically pleasing or there's just so much um, surplus that they can't take it into their stores. So you don't even realize that you know, so much food is going to waste um, because of aesthetics and people are going hungry and people are in poverty all over the world and we're throwing it out because it's just not pretty enough, which is crazy. So what we do is we rescue this produce, we buy it from farmers and then we deliver it to your door 20% less than uh, grocery store prices. So what we're trying to do is really focus on the food aspect of sustainability and we, you know, it's better for the planet because we're not wasting all these resources to, uh, you know, create and, you know, harvest this produce. Um, and then we also give back to our communities as well. So uh, in addition, you know, sustainability is really, really essential in our business model. And we just try to impact as much as possible. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think we have one more response too uh, from Patrick. So yeah, our perspectives is a little bit different just because we're selling, you know, we're selling widgets, essentially, we're selling products on the internet. Sustainability is important for our brand. Um, it's at the core, it's a, a core value in that we, if we're going to do science communication through clothing, um, it would be extremely hypocritical and irresponsible to, to be making clothing in a way that is counter to the very thing we're trying to protect. So we have a responsibility there. Um, I think consumers these days are looking for more than just products. They're looking for something that they um, can have some type of connection with. And I think people are a lot more mindful about the environment each generation. They're becoming more and more mindful. Um, so uh, the sustainability aspect, I think people are looking for companies um, to take stances that are meaningful. Um, and that, that gives them um, a little more interest in that, in that brand kind of being aligned with what the, what the customer's values are. Uh, more specifically to your question about return on investment, we spend a lot of time looking on return on ad spend um, because we have to advertise products to get them to sell. Um, and what we find is, um, you know, we, advertising really has become sort of our primary way um, of communicating with the customer before used to be kind of organic social media, but those days have sort of ended as Facebook has sort of figured out how to like extract money from everybody. Um, but now we use sort of a di diversified approach where we'll maybe do a 30% of our effort on Facebook and Instagram and, and Google advertising. Um, we'll probably do about 30% um, on email remarketing um, using software stuff like Klaviyo where we can have that kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and then 30% maybe on, on sort of other things. But uh, there's really, in our experience, there's no substitute um, to just having a meaningful conversation with your customer. Uh, and that did that one-on-one -on -one, um, email um, or phone conversation. That, and we can't really quantify that, but I suspect that that has um, arguably the greatest return on, on investment um, of all the different types of platforms we use. 
I knew Patrick would have a very quantitative and thorough answer to that question. Uh, yeah, so uh, good to hear everything from science to society. Um, let's, so now that we all have a definition from everyone, what exactly uh, sustainability is and how it is being brought out through all of your businesses and efforts, what are some actual challenges you're dealing with, right? Because sustainability is um, a newer tool that's out there. It's not a new concept. It's a new tool that is being used and similar to Nicholas and Patrick and um, everyone that's using these as something as part of their business model. How, what challenges, what, uh, what has been some pushback that you've had? Have Nicholas? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I think communication is key. And one of the main issues that we found is that we have about 36,000 employees who work for all of our hotels around the globe. And, communic and communicating to those employees the changes that are coming that they're not used to is incredibly difficult because people are not very used to change like that. So I, it, part of my job is to communicate internally to all of those 36,000 employees exactly what those changes are and why it is that we're doing them. So that's one of the main challenges that we still face is not just the fact that we need to communicate to those employees, but that there are cultural barriers between employees at a hotel in Brazil and at a hotel in Spain. There's language barriers across all of those employees. And then there's also shifting in culture. So if a certain culture does something in one way, who am I to tell them that they should be doing something another way? So it's really tough and you really need to try to find a fine line between the two. And that's still something that we're trying to figure out, but it hasn't stopped us from rolling out these initiatives, but it has sort of prevented us from being able to communicate it to the employees as well as we want to be able to. All right, well, that's interesting. We'll keep, we'll keep gaining perspective on this, Reverend. Cool, so in our work with building bridges, we kind of have to try to translate some of the, um, I try to translate some of the priorities from my community, which is the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. And in terms of the nonprofit, we're using the nonprofit to really articulate a model for indigenous solidarity in this region. So how that plays out is like, um, like our colleagues were saying, the cultural barriers and the misunderstandings that can bring that come up for that. For example, at the county level, I've shared a number of conservation documents and informational materials that was definitely from a conservation perspective from the indigenous communities, but in sharing it with others, they just couldn't understand that what we're talking about could be applied to conservation practices. So I think that that's been some of the challenges that we're dealing with, but I think for us, persistence is key in overcoming these. and. Um, and just being honest and authentic and compassionate with each other too. Yeah, I agree. That's very important. Persistence, passion, and being genuine, I think goes a long way. Um, Rachel? For us, um, a lot of what we deal with are potentially expensive problems that don't have a lot of political will behind them. For example, getting rid of septic tanks and transitioning them uh, onto sewage or fixing the sewage infrastructure. Um, no one wants to spend the money to do that, but it's a really urgent problem that's creating both environmental problems and potentially public health effects as well. And as sea level rise gets worse, our septic tanks become more and more flooded, for, for example. Um, and it's something we're, we're going to have to deal with as a community, but we, you know, lack the political will to make that investment. And that's just one example of many difficult um, types of infrastructure investments that we're going to need to, to make um, and that we need to make now. And so part of what we do as an organization is to provide the scientific basis for why these investments need to be made and then to do the outreach and education of the community to um, share that science and that need and then to hopefully make that culture change um, through the outreach and education pieces like this um, so that people become engaged in the political process and become advocates themselves for their environment and um, for their own health and we engender the political will that we need to make some of these difficult decisions um, to make um, our community what it should be and, and what it needs to be. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, large scale change always has resistance, right? But, um, and then lastly, we'll have Patrick. So this is like a problem that I think we deal with a lot and it uniquely because as a business, people are always inherently skeptical of what you have to say and whether you're, whether you're being disingenuous or whether you're being honest. And, uh, you know, the term greenwashing where a business will display some type of environmental, um, you know, image just to get consumers to buy their products. And one thing that's really difficult is there really is no way to differentiate to a customer whether what you're saying is what you really believe and whether what you really think, or if it's just greenwashing and it's marketing and it's just you trying to sell them on something. And uh, that's a totally new world for me because, you know, as a scientist, I never had to deal with that. I just, you know, you'd, you'd say your position on, a, on, a, on, a, on an issue and people would just take you for what you said. Um, but as a brand, when you put the brand's voice out, um, there is this sort of degree of skepticism that anything that you're saying, you're only saying it to sell something. And uh, that's a really hard um, thing to work around um, and really, you know, some, some brands, what they'll do is they'll find some type of certification or some type of stamp of approval that makes you think, okay, what we're doing is legitimate. Um, I don't really like that track. Um, our long-term solution really is that we have to have candid conversations with our customers. And we have one of the best ways to prove that you actually mean what you say is to be honest about what you're not good at. And if you point out that, hey, this is what we're doing and this is what's not good and you own your faults, people go like, oh, they're not actually hiding anything. Maybe we can trust them. And so it's the, the formation of trust between the customer and the brand is so critical. Um, all it takes is one you know, slip up, one mistake to kind of erode that trust. Um, so we put a lot of emphasis on having transparent, open, communication with our with our community so they know when we tell them something hey we have this new product or this new idea and we think it's the best solution they trust us because they know that we're um we're trustworthy go ahead rachel yeah i just building on what patrick said about trust i think we deal with that as um a nonprofit as well and as they say it takes a lifetime to build a reputation and a second to destroy it um, but you spend so long building up trust um, with the community, with elected officials, with donors, um, with members, and um, we work so hard to make sure that everything that we put out as an organization is science-based and to the highest scientific quality um, that we can possibly produce. And um, there's, this is really the age of um, alternative facts and, and a lot of misinformation, and we see, you know, either intentional or, or even unintentional um, misrepresentations of, of issues going on or people jumping to uh, conclusions. And um, we have to work really hard to be really disciplined with ourselves that we, um, it may you know slow down our response to things, but just double and triple checking everything is really important because you can erode that trust. Um, and then um, you, know, you, you lose a lot of your power and your ability to make change if people don't listen to what you're saying or, or take it as seriously. So um, it can be really hard to um, stick to, to that standard, but uh, we try really hard to do that. And I think um, people have to be trained, especially in this day and age, to be skeptical about things that they're reading and seeing, particularly on social media. And I think that's a key part of education and a lot of the UM students are, are I think, getting. Um, but um, I think particularly for kids now looking at education, um, that that skeptical approach is, is a place where studies have shown that we're really lacking and that we need to, we need to improve. So adhering to science and facts and um, being skeptical about things you read on the internet, key, key lessons. Yeah, thank you. Those are all really great points. Um, so we have heard a lot about science, a lot about business. Um, I do want to, I want to dive into, we have some artists. I want to ask a, a question to our artists here. And so you guys do have a sustainability focus. Beyond that, what particularly inspires your art? 
And what are your motivations to incorporate sustainable mes messages? Houston? Cool. So one of the fascinating things that I've been um, humbled to see the power of art is in the ways that it can convene communities. So there was a couple of projects that we did a number of years ago and that we've had the pleasure of repeating again, which um, created like an interfaith framework for communities to really influence the spiritual dimension of everyday restoration. And so in that action, um, we were able to visit a number of communities all throughout the watershed, uh, learn about their priorities, and get access to really um, remote locations in the back country of, of places. So I think that that's been what has inspired me that it can bring communities together. And um, that's what I've been um, um, humbled to, uh, to work through. Uh, Victoria? Hi, yeah. Um, I think that sometimes it's really hard to explain these scientific findings to people. So that's when I have a background in environmental studies and studio art. So that's when I started realizing the power of art, um, particularly installation art, uh, to raise awareness. So some of the topics that have inspired me is excess. I talked a little bit about that before. So overfishing, deforestation, large scale issues like that have always really interested me. And I try to convey that multiplicity um, in my artwork. So whether it be a sculpture with like 10,000 straws or something like that, I'm trying to bring that multiplicity. Um, and then overall, I think the biggest motivation is the urgency that we're facing. So the urgent need to halt the mass six extinction that we're currently undergoing, the urgent need to resolve the global plastic crisis, the need to reverse climate change, all of these really big issues. And personally, I feel like the more artwork I can create and get out there, the more people I can reach with these messages. Yeah, those are really good points. Um, I, science is hard to communicate and it's hard to get a lot of community members interested in society or in science, excuse me. And so um, I think bringing in art to really get people to pay attention on a deep, deeper level has power that a lot of people haven't realized. So thank you. Um, speaking of science, let's go back to our scientist. And um, I think we're kind of curious on how does science play a role in your sustainability initiative? Um, and how are you using science as a tool to bring su sustainability to the community? Uh, Patrick? So I, um... My answer to that is sort of maybe like a merge of Rachel's previous answer and also sort of Victoria's answer. I think when you're trying to communicate something to people, you have to make sure you're telling, you're sharing the right information, which means that information needs to come from um, the scientific method. It has to come from peer review. It has to be replicate. You know, we need, we need facts. Um, and a lot of people, I think when you, when you live in a, scientific world, you can take that for granted. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily have that background to kind of flush through what is false and what is real. Um, and towards Ra Rachel's point, it's, there's so much information right now. Um, it's easy to kind of live in your echo chamber and find, um, you know, information that just feels the best. Um, I think art going back to your kind of previous question, what Victoria is talking about is, is so incredibly important because if it was just a matter of, of translating, you know, data to people, we wouldn't have any of the problems that we have. People will just listen to them and be, it would be easy. But the problem is, you know, we're heart driven people. You know, we feel, we have emotions, very complex beings. Um, information has to be balanced with emotion and being able to find that magic balance between for, for content, whether it's, a product, whether it's a piece, you know, a piece of information, a blog article, a video, a documentary, whatever it may be, um, being able to have that blend of aesthetic beauty, something that makes you feel something, um, with information so that you learn something is key. If you get too far to one side, you know, if you make content that's strictly entertaining 
and it has no educational value, then you've accomplished kind of nothing. But if you make content that's purely educational and it's so boring that your audience is asleep, you've also accomplished nothing. So it's, it's this finding, I think, that, that magic mix of art and science is critical to science communication. Uh, Nicholas? Yeah, so our, our whole entire wave of change movement is built on the foundation of science. So our, um, it originally started, we brought on a PhD from Stanford, who's now the global sustainability director, who had a PhD in coral reef ecology, to actually build a coral lab at one of our hotels in the Dominican Republic. So about a year ago, we officially opened up our first coral reef laboratory in the Dominican Republic. And we also have a coral nursery in the Dominican Republic as well that we work with. So it sort of, you know, serves a few purposes. Number one is that if you're a guest and you walk by one of the, and you walk by our lab at the hotel and you're on vacation, it's bound to pique your curiosity, right? You're bound to go in there and you're bound to try to figure out and understand what it is that, you know, is going on here. Because one thing that I, you know, learned since working in the tourism industry is that people go on vacation to experience something new. They want to be able to learn. So giving people these opportunities to be able to go and learn something new that's positive for the environment is something that we try to do. And to go back to what we were talking about with science is that all of our projects that we have are rooted in a scientific foundation where we're not performing these projects unless we understand that they're valid and that they're legit. So we have a full, you know, we have a full-time lab manager who works at our coral lab to study the impacts of coral bleaching in the Dominican Republic. Same thing with our coral nursery. So, you know, to, to wrap it up, the wave of change movement that we have is built on the foundation of science. Uh, Rachel? Sorry, I think I kind of jumped the gun on this question in the last round, but uh, <laughs> um, just to fill in a few more gaps here, I think our role as um, a nonprofit is in, a, in large part connecting scientists to policymakers because we always talk about that and the idea has always been kind of abstract to me until I, I first started working in the Senate and saw how important it is to get the science to the policymakers, but also as a nonprofit, how I've now begun to realize how many policy decisions are being made with incomplete science. And um, I see a large part of our role as understanding what kind of answers the policymakers need um, in order to um, make the decisions. And so we know a lot of the scientists, we know a lot of the policymakers. We're like, okay, well, all the scientists are using these units in their research, but the policymakers need them in these units. Like it's sometimes something as simple as that. And we can help sort of translate um, between the two. And we've actually, as a nonprofit, still publish peer reviewed literature, um, usually with the goal of. Um, of helping uh, make management decisions. And, and that's been really key. And a, a lot of times you hear the science is the science, um, but that's not always the case unless maybe you're looking at, at a raw uh, spreadsheet of data. It's always interpreted in some way and it's always filtered um, in a certain way. So it, it's really important for us to uh, remain neutral and to still employ the highest scientific principles that we can in, in making those decisions and translating them to people and to policymakers. Uh, Victoria? Yeah, I 100% agree with um, the whole science communication uh, topic and using it as a powerful tool. Um, but we talked a lot about that already, so I'll just move forward. Um, in my artwork, I would like to start taking more of a scientific approach in my process. So I've done like larger scale um, coastal cleanups where we sorted trash and all of that, but I would like to start monitoring it more closely so that I don't just have like anecdotal observations, but more like scientific data um, and be able to use that as information to accompany my artwork. Um, building off of that, I think it'd be really cool to start working with um, on like specific projects with specific scientists or wildlife biologists. Um, to not only raise awareness about a topic, but then also have a strategic plan 
to um, use this artwork and or campaign to create policy change. So that's sort of where I'm at. Uh, Reverend? Uh, Reverend, go ahead. Cool, so thank you. In the, to in the topic of um, <clears throat> science, like our um, organization, the Love the Everglades Movement has been greatly inspired by the type of science that's being um, conducted by the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. And they actually have their own version of the EPA. They have a Miccosukee EPA, Fish and Wildlife and Land Management. And so like we've been really inspired by seeing how the scientists that work for the Miccosukee Tribe rely on input from community elders. So when we put the tools in the hands of the community, it has really um, led the way for new research and yielded policies that have been restorative of the area. And so um, on another note, I've also been inspired by how scientific data in communicating, and I'd just like to give some love to some artistic residencies in South Florida, including the ARI organization and the art sale residency. And they're doing great work combining the arts with the sciences. So I recommend y'all check them out too. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that everyone's bringing forth a different perspective on sustainability and highlighting how um, the intersection of more than one area, more than science, more than art um, is really what is impactful. Um, let's bounce back to uh, another business question, right? So um, your, some of your individual businesses really are able to uh, have sustainability at that core, but what do you recommend for newer businesses to take on board beyond being genuine, beyond, um, uh, you know, the facts? How would one use sustainability to really push a business forward? Okay, Nicholas. Yeah, so um, it's, I, I feel very fortunate that I work for a company that is privately owned and it's it's been a privately owned company. It's a fourth generation hotel company. And the fact of the matter is that we wouldn't be able to, you know, we wouldn't be able to do some of our sustainability initiatives if the family wasn't 100% behind this. So it really starts at the top. And in order to, if, you know, in order to implement different sustainability initiatives, in order to implement different projects that you have, it really has to start at the top and it has to start from a place that's genuine. If it's coming from a place that's not, then it's not going to come off as genuine to everybody else. And then you're going to end up like Patrick was saying earlier, if you don't have that trust with your customers, then it's never going to end up working out in the end. So the advice would be to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, regardless if it's sustainability, regardless if it's you know working towards a more environment, you know less of an environmental impact, just make sure that it's coming from a genuine place. Allison, yeah, so definitely agree that it definitely should come from a genuine place for sure, um, and just how businesses can incorporate sustainability into their business plans overall. I'd say that I'd have four steps. Um, first would be just to get educated. So make sure that all you know partners, et cetera, know why this is important and how it's really beneficial to and for the business. Um, then I would assess. So I would assess what the current sustainable practices are and what you guys are doing right, and then trying to find opportunities on what you could be doing better. Then after that, I would just establish a clear sustainability objective and vision for the business. And then after that, all of that, then you would just start implementing that. Awesome, great answer. Patrick? I think, I mean, I think as time progresses, the idea of sustainability and, and socially responsible, environmentally responsible businesses is going to become more of just the norm. I think that people are going to expect it. And if you look just gener generationally, you know, we, 
be, if I go to a school and get to meet young kids, um, climate change isn't even really like, it, it's not debated. The kids understand it. Um, they, they've grown up in a different world that our parents grew up in. So I think moving forward, this, it's going to become less of a um, sort of like a, an outlying benefit of your business and it's going to become just a requirement. Um, and part of that is just logical because most sustainable decisions tend to be good business decisions, um, economically speaking. Um, on the flip side of that, as more and more businesses become more sustainably focused, it will be more and more difficult to differentiate yourself from everybody else because everyone else is going to be doing it too. Um, so I think it's important to kind of find what your what your niche is, um, what your passion is, and just as the other panelists have, have brought up, um, sticking to your guns on what you are um, really passionate about. I mean, I know at least for me, I got, I, we run a business, but I like never wanted to be a businessman. I just do this because it's sort of like, I kind of fell into it, but um, we have certain things, certain lines that we're not willing to cross. And those can be really difficult. Um, when you have an opportunity to do something that might be very, say, profitable, that might create jobs and, and give people income and such. But if it crosses a line that, that you were not willing to cross, maybe early on in the development of your idea, you really have to hold yourself to that and not cross the line. Because once, once those dominoes start falling, um, I, I, I fear that you can quickly kind of lose the soul of what it is that you did to start. So, my recommendation would be, you know, it'll be difficult to, to differentiate, differentiate yourself, but find your thing, stick to it, and, um, and uh, don't, don't sacrifice your ideals for making more money. Great. Those are really great answers. Thank you for taking that one and running. Um, we do have some questions from some of our attendees that I would like to start incorporating. Um, one is from Alexia, and she is curious how the panel um, addresses their thoughts on the expense of living sustainability and how they deal with that as part of their efforts in their own day-to-day -day life. So the expense of sustainability, because I do, um, like with greenwashing, with living all organic, going to Whole Foods, it's kind of how it's presented sometimes. Um, so what uh how do you guys deal with the expense of sustainability in your day-to-day -day lives victoria yeah that's a great question um i over since 2017 is when i first was sort of awakened to the whole plastic issue um and since then i've quit uh single-use plastics that you would get from like delivery for example um and sort of from that journey i've had to bite the bullet a couple of times of buying something that's more expensive up front, um, but that I would uh, get return from in the long run. And I was just realizing how these were investments that were really hard for people to make. So I started putting together, it's a public spreadsheet where I've put down all of um, these items that I've, or products that I've tried and really honest reviews about them. And so I wanted that to be a public resource for anyone to access and the link to it will be in my Instagram bio. So feel free to add to it, review it, um, just use it as a resource. And the goal was to save people time and money so that they don't buy something that won't be a good fit for them. That's awesome. Uh, Allison? So um, as you said, you know, whole foods can get really expensive, but you know, we have Hungry Harvest. <laughs> so it's 20% less than groceries are quite interested in that. In addition to food, um, I just do a lot of simple swaps. I mean, I know that, you know, just switching out, you know, a plastic water bottle, like Victoria was saying, for a reusable one, a straw, you know, reusable grocery bags. I know those are small things, but they really do make a difference when you keep doing these small little items, especially because you know, maybe your friends or your family or anyone that's around you are like, hey, like, where'd you get that? Like, why are you using that? Why aren't you using this instead? So you have that conversation with people and then, you know, this just all begins to spread and it all, you know, you're just setting a good example and people will take your lead and all of those little things can really add up. 
And things like another thing, um, there's free things too. I mean, um, if you've heard of Ecosia, I think I'm saying that right. It's E C O uh, S I A. It's a search engine. Um, it's similar to Google. And every time that you search with that search engine, they plant trees and it's at no cost to you. So there's a lot of little things like that where you can utilize those and just make those little changes and it really can make a difference. Patrick? I think one thing I think is really important with these types of questions, whenever you bring in the idea of like the economics of being sustainable personally, I think that those, that topic has to be framed um, very empathetically. I think if, if I know when I've ever traveled to third world countries or, or places where people just can barely put food on their table, understandably, um, environmental sustainability is often very low on the priority list in those, those places. And uh, that makes sense. And I think it's important to recognize that living a environmentally sustainable lifestyle oftentimes means that you have the ability to do that. And there are a lot of people in the world that don't because they just can barely survive. So I think it's important to always frame that, frame that kind of question in that light. Um, with that said, you know, just everyone's different. So it's important to what one person does versus another person does. It's, it's not so important to compare what other people are doing. Um, it's more important for you to just, to just do whatever it is that you can do. Um, and identifying within your own life something um, that you can make improvements on. I know in during this whole shutdown, you know, I've been trying to like do like a push-up challenge. I'm trying to like get like not just sit around and drink coffee and like get a beer gut. Um, and I've been trying to like make incremental improvements on exercising. And it's a good metaphor. Like once you start, once you just kind of get a little bit of momentum, um, it can be um, it can be really inspiring. I think that's the most, it's not so important necessarily what people do, it's that they do something and then they start getting momentum and they start building on it. And that we all try to be empathetic with each other in terms of what one another is doing because it's very easy to kind of poke holes like, oh, you shouldn't do that or that's really not that important or we can get all lost in the weeds with all this stuff. Um, but just get going and uh, do your very best and be supportive of one another. Yeah, um, I always say do what you can when you can. Integrate changes when you can. So uh, that was a great question, Alexia. Uh, we only have a few more minutes. So I do want to wrap up with one last question. Um, so what suggestions do you guys have for staying positive right now? It is a COVID situation. We are trapped here. And so what, uh, what, positivity are you finding through sustainability? I think Patrick kind of mentioned some of that now is just like uh, balancing his day-to-day -day life. Does anyone else have comments or take-home messages related to that? Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I sort of alluded to this at the beginning, um, but some of the silver lining that we've been able to find um, in the whole shutdown is that we've really given um, nature a little bit of a break and given it room to breathe and a lot of people are having some really incredible wildlife encounters as a result. Uh, for example, we had somebody who filmed two endangered small tooth sawfish from their balcony near Margaret Pace Park. It's the first time two have been filmed together and that's a particularly degraded part of this game bay. Um, we actually, it inspired us to launch a Sea a Fish, Send a Fish campaign as part of our Thousand Eyes on the Water program where we train the public to observe, document, and report pollution and wildlife they might see. Um, so both a combination, I think, of the fact we haven't had that much rainfall recently and the fact that the water is just really quiet. We've had less noise pollution on the water from a lack of boats. Um, wildlife is coming out. So we've had uh, man manta rays, manatees, turtles, dolphins, sharks, um, and of course, these small tooth sawfish uh, being reported to us. And, also with the water really clear, we've been able to see debris um, that isn't normally visible. So we've been able to report that and get that taken away. And people are um, 
are, I think, more connected with the world around them. I was reading an article that um, everybody's becoming a backyard birder as well. So <laughs> um, I think in, you know, the Miami version of that where, you know, people are lucky enough to live with a water view or walk along the water or have uh, Biscayne Bay or the ocean as their backyard, uh, which is all of our backyards. Um, hopefully I will be able to access it again soon. Uh, people are, are getting that connection and it's, engaging people to also see problems on the water and report it. So yesterday we also had um, somebody re unfortunately report um, an oil slick on the water and uh, we were able to call a Coast Guard and get them to come out and respond to that. So uh, again, you know, people are connecting in ways with marine life and then it's leading to uh, cleaner waters ultimately. And, and we're also hearing reports, of, you know, more sea turtles nesting, less manatee ship strikes and things like that. So just, um, overall less pollution, more wildlife, um, and we're, we're kind of seeing what, what we lose with the impact that we have on the environment, but also a silver lining and some positivity for how that might change behavior in the future. Yes, definitely. Reverend? Um, just to say that the idea of reciprocity and showing up for one another um, has been really um, like um, empowering for the heart, for the spirit, for um, for a sense of compassion, and that we should be bold in the ways that we can claim a relationship with the natural world. Um, we enjoy so much of the benefits of an extractive relationship. Turn on the switch, you got power. Turn on the faucet, you got water. Well, all that comes from um, our relationships with the natural world. And so be bold. You can claim a spiritual relationship without having to believe in a deity. Um, ideas like peace, compassion, tolerance, joy, these are spiritual principles, and we can find that as we deepen our relationships with one another and with the natural world. So I think that's uh, one of the benefits, the positive benefits. Victoria? Whenever I feel a little bit depressed about all of these issues, I always think back to this Jane Goodall quote, which is that there's still a lot worth fighting for. And I just like to add to it that we have to start acting now though. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that as well. Um, I would like to thank everyone. Um, I think we are out of time a little bit, um, but I would like to thank all of my panelists. You guys are all great community leaders that really embrace sustainability. Um, and happy Earth Week, happy Earth Day. Um, stay positive. <laughs>